I am now here to um, introduce to you Mr. Andrew Hinton, the author of The Understanding Context, Environment, Language, and Information Architecture. So Andrew works at State Farm as a digital experience, senior digital experience architect in the UX Center for Excellence here in Atlanta, and he has previously served as a senior consultant for the Understanding Group. Andrew is a co-founding member of the Information Architecture Institute, so with celebrity in the house, people. Uh-huh. And has, and has worked for more than 20 years helping organizations make information, make better places for humans. Please welcome Andrew. Hi, everybody. Was that loud enough? Can you hear me? Can you? Is mic on? Sorry. Uh, is there a feedback? You want some feedback? Are you missing that yet? Uh, this is great. Uh, there's a lot of people here. This is a really big, this has turned into a big event. Uh, World IA Day is pretty, pretty awesome. Um, and uh, a couple times now, this organization called the Information Architecture Institute has been mentioned. Uh, can I just in encourage you to go out there and check it out and become a member, uh, contribute. It is still, even though it's been around a long time now, it's still a small organization uh, run by volunteers. And, uh, uh, and everybody that gets involved in it, uh, it, it generally comes out feeling like uh, they really were rewarded for that. So definitely encourage that. Um, patter, 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 while people get settled. <laughs> no, we're good. OK, I'm going to jump in. So uh, I, I have a confession to make. And I don't know if I'm the only one here that's, that's feeling this way, but lately, uh, I'm a mess. Anybody else? Uh, thank goodness, because if I got up here and you were like, what the hell are you talking about? I'd be, okay, sorry. The rest of the talk has been suspended. Um, lately, just, you know, especially since, uh, well, even this time last year or so, right, I've just been obsessed. Really over, I mean, I'm an obsessive person in general. That's what my therapist tells me, uh, or all my therapists, plural, have told me. Um, and, uh, but this has been weird, right? Um, it, we're not in normal times. I don't think anybody can disagree with that, at least in this, in, in this place we live in, right? This country we live in. So today I'm going to talk about something that's a little bit bigger than your typical design talk. It's a keynote, so I'm allowed, right? Uh, I want to talk about truth. I've been seeing the phrase post-truth a lot. You guys seen the phrase post-truth with a little dash, a little hyphen? Is that a dash or a hyphen? I'm terrible at that. Um, anyway, as in we're living in a post-truth world, and since information architecture is largely about what things are, where they go, and how they're connected together, then knowing whether something's true or not seems to be a germane issue for doing information architecture. Uh, it seems to me we ought to consider how can we do that kind of work if truth is called into question. So, for example, no, get ahead of me here. So, for example, a recent event occurred that caused shock, consternation. Uh, millions of people, it resulted in, in these violent arguments between friends and neighbors and family members and coworkers. Some of us just it made us question, like, who our neighbors are and how other people see the world. You probably, I'm sure you already know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the dress. <laughs> so everybody's heard of this, right? Okay, almost two years ago, February 26, 2015, a photograph of this dress um, went viral on the internet and people were obsessed with it. How could two people look at the same picture and see completely different colors? Uh, now, this is, you know, gamed out, right? Uh, this isn't just the one picture. This has been adjusted to kind of give you a sense of the way it was looking to different people. Um, it made some of us wonder if the rest of the world was playing a prank on us. Anybody else feel like this? Like, wait, you're messing with me, right? Is this one of these memes where it's like you heard from somebody else, oh, do this, and then it gets carried around, you know, like those tweets where somebody says, oh, this is amazing, and then there's a link, and it's to another tweet that says, you've got to see this, and there's, a, you know, and you're like, okay, so, okay, guys, enough. Uh, I'm busy today. Why are, you, why are you doing this? Like, it felt like that. Like, who's messing with me? But it was for real, right? There wasn't really a joke. It was just, it was just different people perceiving different things. 
Now, there are valid explanations for this phenomenon. They involve the complexities of uh, how we perceive things, uh, dig what, the way digital media works in general. Like, uh, you know, it, is it the same in print? Is it the same in person? When you're representing something in digital photograph, um, uh, there's some differences there. Uh, and linguistics, right? Because really, part of what's going on here is what is blue? What is white? What is black? Is it the pigment in the fabric, or is it what we see reflected from it? So if you've ever tried to buy colors for your house that look great in the store, and then you paint them on the wall, and then you feel like you're in a day-glow nightmare uh, because the lighting is different in your house, um, this kind of thing happens, right? So just one fun example of how we can be perceiving really different things in the world and understanding them in different ways. Um, this story reminds me of this uh, famous optical illusion. We've seen this before, right? Only a few? Okay, okay, good, all right. Uh, I'm, just gonna, I'm gonna make you move around. Um, just your arm, though, because that's, it would be hypocritical to make me make you move more than like one limb at a time. Um, so is it a rabbit or a duck, right? Okay, who can see both? Okay, good, all right. Sometimes I meet people who are like, I'm sorry, I just don't see it. I'm like, this is like 150 years old. <laughs> You haven't seen this before? Um, is it a, it, it, maybe it's a dabbit, a, a, a ruck? Uh, what's interesting is that you show this to people or similar optical illusions that where you could see two different things. And if you put a label on it, it just slots them right into that, right? Oh, that's a duck, because it says duck, right? Oh, that's a rabbit. Oh, I, see the, I see that rabbit. Yeah, yeah, it's, it says rabbit there. Um, labels are powerful. Language is powerful. This is language too, by the way, it's just pictorial. Uh, labels are powerful and they nudge us into seeing things in different ways. Because if you put an optical illusion like this in front of somebody that's labeled and they say, oh, I see, I see this in it, it's not like they're rationally thinking to themselves, I, I don't know what this is, but I'm seeing a label. So, right, no, it's, oh yeah, it's a, it's a this. Um, language, we swim in it, right? It's our natural medium as humans. Uh, it's been with us for over a million years, and uh, in one way or another, and it, 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 we don't realize, right, what it's doing a lot of the time in our world. Our environment, our whole environment nudges us all the time. It controls a lot of what we do in ways we don't understand, or every day we don't understand in just our daily activities, to the point where we think we're looking at truth. We think that we're seeing something the way it is, but then we're puzzled when somebody else sees a different truth because their context is different from ours. Their way of understanding the world and therefore the language about the world has a different point of reference than ours. Now this is not a, val this is not a value statement, right? This is not saying whether it is good or bad. It's just a fact. It's just a phenomenon in terms of the way meaning works. A recent cartoon shows a television newscast where the announcer says, that was Brad with the Democratic weather and now here's Tammy with the Republican weather. <laughs> So with this newly pernicious, uh, pernicious uh, meme of fake news, right, that sort of was used by one side and then got weaponized by another side, uh, we're increasingly in conflict about what is true. Um, it's getting to where you're starting to realize, oh, I've been taking for granted the fact that this publication prints true things, but now they're being called into question, so how do I find out? You can't possibly go around the whole world and just go to all the things that are being reported on and, and see for yourself, right? At some point, we've got to trust the information you're getting. Our identities and our communities very, very powerfully shape the way that we perceive the world around us, the way we grew up, all that stuff. This is, you know this. So we had an election uh, in the United States recently. Anybody kept up with that, the election? <laughs> you're familiar with the election? Um, I'm not sure if you've heard about it, so let me show you the results. These are the results. These are all accurate-ish. Um, the one on the left is plainly manipulative, in a sense, whether they realize it, the per person who made it realized it or not, because it's essentially equating square acreage with the voting populace. But it can be used to have a chilling effect on the people who were represented by the not red color in there, uh, to feel like, oh no, we're outnumbered, we better just get in line, right? The one in the middle is trying to kind of split the difference a little bit by um, having different shades, right? It's getting there. This one is trying to still do the 
the plain red and blue, but then it has to warp the shape of the country in order to make that fit. These actually I grabbed from a Twitter uh, uh, flame war that was going on during the Super Bowl between some people. Uh, <laughs> and it was a trip. Um, maps like this have agendas, whether we want them to have them or not. Anytime we represent a part of the world, we have to represent it in a way that is only a subset of that world, or else then we're just pointing at the world, right? So uh, when we talk about or show or whatever things in the world, it's, it's narrowing, it's making a decision about what part of that truth am I, am I going to show you. Most of the time we do that without thinking about it because who has time to think about every darn thing we say or do. But no matter what you do here, you're gonna run into the same problem because people can be looking at that, the same facts and see different things in them and they're gonna mean different things to them. So here we go, uh, we've been hearing phrases like real Americans. So those maps had a lot to do with this uh, semantic uh, storm around things like, who are the real Americans? We've been hearing our leaders say things like, uh, the people. But then they'll talk about how, well, the people are like this, and these other ones are the enemies of those people. So does that mean that they are not people? Right? Well, that's the syllogism. If these are the people, and these are enemies of the people, then the enemies are not people. This is an old trick. We've seen it in history many times. Um, these are labels, and labels have power. Whether we label something a duck or a rabbit or a person or a non-person, or even, even more malevolently in a way just a blank, right? Labels matter. So uh, locally, recent story in our state of Georgia, there's an effort underway to add non-citizen as a label to licenses of legal residents who have green cards. And, but it's just a label, right? I mean, all you're doing is you're adding more information to a license. How could it hurt? It's this little smidgen of metadata. It's an attribute in a database that we're just now making it visible. So technically, it's accurate. What's the harm? But think about how we use the word citizen in our colloquial everyday life? Do we think of it in this, uh, this, this uh, uh, formal definition that is used uh, in a municipal government? Or do we think of it as my neighbor? You're a citizen, you're a citizen, all these citizens in here, right? We're all citizens together, trying to be good citizens. If you're not a citizen, you can't be a good one. So now what does it mean to take that little thing and stick it on driver's licenses, right? It, it, it meets the engineering requirements. It's accurate, it's technically accurate, but what does it mean? What does it mean in our cultural context? Who are the real people? Labels have power. Uh, definitions have power. In Kansas, there's an effort to manipulate how the law treats gender by defining the word sex to mean male or female as absolute binaries. And then determining it by the chromosomes of the individual and identifying it by the anatomy. Now, just trying to pick apart exactly what they mean by these things is a mess, right? I mean, look, those of us who understand how biology and psychology work realize this is a primitive, ignorant, brutally, overly simplistic model. And, we, and, and I think we all know what the, what, the, uh, what the political impetus behind it is. But there we are. Labels matter, language has power. It shapes the way that we understand the world and the way we behave in it toward one another. And language is owned by, uh, by the people who are in power. They get to use it in ways they want to and they get to constrain the people who don't have the power. So what does any of this have to do with World Information Architecture Day? We're here to have fun. Andrew, yeah, you're leaning next door. Oh my God, I was trying to get away, I was trying to get away from politics. What the hell? Um, these are not normal times, right? So really everything I was talking about, it has everything to do with information architecture. Information architecture is about bringing clarity and understanding to ambiguity. It's about establishing coherent meaning. Information architecture uses language as its primary medium for placemaking and sense-making. And as our friend Jorge Arango, uh, a co-author of the new edition of the Polar Bear book over there, uh, as he eloquently puts it, it's about preserving the integrity of meaning across contexts. 